Uh, interesting question I got here from the last video. In summary, somebody's in university, they fail, they think that they might fail their math class again, which would put them in a bad situation. This person has a background in coding, they've developed some APIs with Python and Django, and they're wondering if she, they should jump ship, should they fail again, or go to another university, or go in there as a dev in South Africa. But in the beginning, devs in South Africa make low money. They don't make too much money. So I'm just going to read this off and I'm going to give you my answers. Hey, Stefan, need to need some help here. So I'm at the end of my second year in university in computer science. I didn't make the math module, the only module I failed so far in the first year and had to repeat it. And so I did everything I could to pass this year. But in the end, the end of the year exam just didn't go well now. The issue is that university has a policy where they will exclude you from registration if you fail the same module twice. So. If I don't make my math, then that will happen. So basically, if he fails again his math, he will, I guess he won't be able to register again in university. I am, I am very passionate about programming. I have been doing it since ninth grade. I have freelance for a while, providing REST API services, REST API services and Python Django web applications. And that has gone well, earning some money on the side. I do have somewhat populated GitHub profile. If bad comes to worse and I don't pass math, should I try again at another university or should I just jump ship into the workforce, even though self-taught devs here really get low salaries in the beginning in South Africa? So I don't know about the specifics of South Africa, but let me give you some general advice about this. First of all, math and programming is rare. Besides multiply and divide and add and subtract, math and programming is rare. The fact that they make you do advanced math, I'm assuming you're, 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 you're not doing you're not failing, you know, multiplication here and division. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure about that. To have people do calculus and other advanced math and programming, in my humble opinion, from two decades of software development, is ridiculous. Ridiculous. Um, the only time you need advanced math is maybe if you're getting into game engine design, maybe if you're going to get into certain types of AI, but a lot of times, not a lot of times, just about all the time, they have they have libraries that you can leverage where all that math is all there for you. So instead of having to figure out the physics of uh, a physics of, a, of some sort of widget that you have, some sprite as they call it in game uh, programming in, uh, in your game, instead of trying to have to figure out and do all the, the advanced physics, there's just a module that you just go boop and leverage that and they take care of it. So again, let me reiterate, to force developers to take advanced math is ridiculous. It's, it's a little vexing for me that they force people with these stupid requirements. I remember when I was in college and I was looking to get into university, and at one point I was thinking of getting into business. Uh, and I, I rejected it because they needed like cal, calculus two, cal two to even to get into business, uh, you know, I forget the program, the business education in university. And it was ridiculous because I, you know, my parents, my family have been in business for years and been, you don't need calculus. You never use calculus in business, but they would make it a artificial requirement for people to get into uh, business administration uh, and any type of business oriented finance you don't need any of this advanced math it's this it's not nonsense same thing with programming so don't let that get you down anybody out there is listening to this and you're worried that if your math is weak that you won't be able to get into the pro programming that is all garbage that's this it's, it's, it's you don't use math most of the time 99.999 percent of the time what they should be doing instead of teaching you calculus they should be teaching you uh uh, more software development, uh, architecture, you should be teaching communication, business communication skills, project assessment skills, far, 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 far more valuable than advanced math. So back to this person's dilemma. If you fail this math for a second time and you can't get back into the school and you're saying that entry level devs in South Africa don't make much money, let me ask you a question. In South Africa, is it like other places in the world? Once you get past that entry level, salaries even up. 
whether or not you have that degree or not. Another thing you can do is freelancing. Freelancers actually in, after they establish themselves, a couple years maybe, they make more money than they would be making if they work for somebody. So this is the dilemma that you're faced with now. If you want to go work for a very large corporations that have HR departments, banks and big insurance companies or something, yes, then the not having the university degree will count it, strike against you. There's no question about that because they're HR departments. But even Google put out something about a year or two ago. Google, Google said that, and I'm emphasizing Google, said that they evaluated people they hired who had university degrees versus people who hired had no degrees, and they found that the level of skill was the same. If actually, and I could be wrong about this, don't call me, it was either at least the same or better, meaning people who they were hired had no university degree actually turned out to be better coders and programmers and developers and employees than people who had university, university degrees. It was at least equal. So I think when Google says that and they get the best of the best, that tells you something where that is going, where that is going. So uh, I think that over the next many years, I think that the, um, the requirement of university degrees in the software development field will uh, diminish. And there was an article in Forbes recently, they were talking about how online education was basically a threat to the current educational model, university higher educational model. And they were talking about how Ivy League schools in the US were now offering online versions of their programs for like you know a fraction of the cost. Instead of spending having to spend fifty thousand dollars a year to go to Harvard or Yale or whatever it was, you could do it online and pay the university five hundred. And they were taking the same programs. Now if you did the online program at Yale or something, you didn't get a degree, an official degree, but you got some sort of certificate. And what the Forbes article was saying was that sooner or later, employers will realize that the people will get the certification, online certification from a particular school, they're going to be as good as the people who went to the brick and mortar. And once that becomes more and more common and prevalent, then all of a sudden the value of, of that brick and mortar traditional higher education is going to diminish quite a bit because employers are not going to see a difference between the online people versus the brick and mortar people. I think it's going to go to the next step. I think, and I see it now, as more and more people, a little bit of uh, self-promotion here, but as more and more people come out of Studio Web, taught lots, and, you, and you're going to see people who learn coding from me and software development from me, they have a high level of skill, and they perform really well because I teach them the fundamentals, I teach them proper structure and coding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People are going to start realizing that, you know, good to get a candidate, somebody from Studio Web, versus some school where you have a college professor who doesn't have much real-world experience in coding. So the curriculum is reflective of for lack of real world coding. I get this from my, um, my uh, martial arts background. When I wanted to learn how to box, I didn't go find some person who, uh, who passed a bunch of tests and, uh, and, and, and you know, got a certificate in boxing. No, no, I found a, somebody who had an amazing record as a fighter, 77 fights, 77, 77 wins out of 79 fights, which is like, world-class, uh, world-beating record. It's unbelievable how good he was in terms of his actual fighting experience. And I can tell you something. Somebody who has that level of uh, accomplishment in the ring has uh, a subtle understanding of the game, a subtle understanding of the science of boxing that put them there. Besides raw talent, and I can tell you that he taught us all these little subtleties that made the difference between winning or losing because of his tremendous experience. And you learn a lot by doing. You learn a lot by doing. And you're going to see that in your coding career. I always tell people, write code every day, write code every day. It's amazing how seemingly abstract, advanced, hard to understand theoretical concepts in coding become much 
easier to understand and quite clear if you write the code. That's the key. You got to write the code. Just like when I was learning how to fight, I would get in the ring. I would spar 20 rounds a night, you know, three times, four times a week, five times a week. You know, not super hard, but full contact fighting, you know. And every time I would do a three rounds of sparring, it's the equivalent of months and months of training. Every time you sit there and you write code and you try to build something tangible, even small little projects, it's like, you know, two hours of writing code is equivalent of a week or two of reading and studying about code. It's really that important that you actually write real code. So should this student go back, uh, try to another university? It depends. I'm not sure about the South African market. I'm not sure whether or not after a couple of years the uh, exponents in South Africa, meaning the people who, uh, who are uh, coding in the real world, whether their salaries catch up because they're good, or, or are you forever handicapped by the fact that you didn't have a degree? I guess that largely depends on what type of work you want to do and where you want to work. So you've got to keep all that in mind. So for me, to answer the question depends on what those, you know, what the answers of the previous questions are. I just want you to take away that A, math is not really important in software development for the most part, with some exceptions like game programming and stuff, but it's very rare. And uh, number two, I would look at not the short term, I always look at the medium long term. The short term passes quick, right? One year is like this. And if you see over you know, two years, the salaries between the people who have a D, the university degree versus people who don't have a university degree, if they start to even out, then I wouldn't worry too much about the university degree in the, for the most part. But I don't know what the South African market is all, all, is all about. And the other thing is the cost. Like I tell people, if you're in the U.S. and you're racking up huge amounts of debt, I would skip higher education. I would just get into the workforce because I was talking about this with regards to Python data scientists, uh, data scientists who write Python. A lot of Python salaries are uh, skewed north, meaning their salaries are pushed up on the averages because of the data scientists that are using Python. Now, you can't learn Python and become a data scientist. You have to first become a data scientist, then you learn, you learn Python along the way. So you need that advanced degree as a data scientist before you can make the data scientist money. Now, the thing is, if you look at the people who get the data scientist degrees and they're writing Python code, initially they're making a little bit more than the people who just come out and just, people are just doing PHP or people just doing C Sharp or people just doing JavaScript. But after like four or five years, it all kind of evens out. Here's the thing though. You could get a job writing PHP if you've done a, a, you know, a bunch of PHP projects, freelancing and so on. You can show a nice portfolio. You can show that you can write code. You can get a good paying job pretty quickly within, you know, within, uh, within a year. And your salary just climb quite a bit as you get better and better at what you do. Whereas the data scientist is going to take them, they're going to have to get their, their degree. So you're looking at another four or five years, or perhaps six, for these people to be able to get the data scientist degree. So you're four or five years ahead of them. So maybe four or five years, you've made an extra 400 grand, 300 grand in, in the West anyway, versus the data scientist guy who's still in school, just spending money. So he finally gets out of school and he starts, you know, and he, so he's, but you're already three, four hundred thousand dollars ahead. And if you look at the stats I cited in the previous video, in the early stages, the data scientist might make an extra four or five thousand dollars a year in San Francisco versus a PHP programmer or a C-sharp programmer who doesn't need a degree. You know, how, it's, impossible, it's literally impossible that the data scientist will catch up to the PHP or the JavaScript programmer or the Ruby programmer or the Python programmer who didn't get a degree. It would be literally impossible for the data scientist to spend an extra four years in school to catch up because those four years, you've made hundreds of thousands of dollars. They'll never catch up. You'll always be way ahead of them in terms of how much money you've earned. So keep that in mind as well. Anyway, very long vlog. I hope you found this interesting. This is one of my vlogs in the car. I do the vlogs in the car because uh, it's a change of pace in terms of uh, scenery. But also, if I come up with an idea, I stop the car and I sit down and I start recording. All right, I hope this was useful. Ciao.